everybody, and welcome to our webinar today, Key Trends in Emerging Brands and Pet. I figured no better way to start a webinar at work than with your dog. Everybody meet Cooper, my Pomeranian, one of my best friends on the planet, and probably the thing in my house I spend the most money on other than, let's face it, I'm a woman, makeup and beauty care. So that's my second favorite category, which I think we're going to be covering next month. Um, so get excited to tune in for more webinars like this moving forward. Um, today, I'm joined by my colleague, Anthony Raymond, who is the head of professional services at Circle Up, and my colleague, Sam Blumenthal, who is a partner on our investing team at Circle Up. And we're so excited to have you here. Um, we love our pets. Uh, we invest in pet brands. We're super excited about what Helio thinks about pet brands. And so we are just really thrilled about this category and so excited to have you guys joining us. Before we get into things, just give you kind of a rundown on the agenda for our conversation today. We'll start with a little bit of Helio fundamentals, just some knowledge for you guys ahead of Anthony pre presenting analysis so that you understand what is in that and, and why we're excited about Helio's predictions on the space and pet. And then um, following Anthony's analysis and review on emerging trends and uh, brands to keep an eye on. We're going to have a short Q&A with Sam Blumenthal in terms of how Circle Up has historically used Helio to drive our own investing. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and get into things. You guys know this, especially if you're attending this webinar, consumer goods is a massive and growing sector. There's more than 500,000 emerging CPG brands. And what this means is basically it has always, always been a challenge for CPGs, investors, and retailers to keep a pulse on emerging brands and emerging innovations in this category. But we had tools that helped us do this. We had the SPINs and the Nielsen's and the IRIs of the world. We had conferences like Expo West and Expo East until we didn't. Um, the pandemic happened and it got exponentially harder for us to keep a pulse on everything happening in the consumer space because literally overnight, the way we consume changed. Like I'll raise my hand and say, I used to love going to the grocery store. Like I work in CPG, it's a hobby of mine to actually go into the store and pick up some of my favorite products. During the pandemic, that wasn't possible. Literally overnight, the world went from going into store to having the store brought to them. And in addition to having the store brought to us at home, we also spent more time behind our screens than ever before. And so basically what happened is the way we consume changed, like as a society, Overnight, the way we consume changed. So I wanted to start here today. Think about the last few purchases that you guys made as consumers. Close your eyes, think of it. For me, it was Hint Water most recently. Where did you discover that brand for the first time? For me, Hint Water actually read the founder's book. That was how I discovered Hint. Did you discover the brand that you're thinking of at the grocery store? Maybe it was an Instagram ad. Maybe it was an influencer that you follow on TikTok, or maybe it was a friend of yours that posted on Facebook. Perhaps it was that you subscribed to FabFitFun or BarkBox and you got your new favorite product there. Let that be true, however you discovered that brand. Now, close your eyes and imagine the version of you that existed before the pandemic, you in 2019. How did you consume then? My guess says it's, it's, is it's really different. Just a couple of years ago, this wasn't a conversation that needed to be had, but it's a really important conversation to have now. Not only has how we've consumed changed, but how brands are coming to market has changed as well. In 2013, I was a product manager at Spins tasked with building our store level data product to help emerging brands in market. And at the time, a better for you brand, their best path to market was this build a great product, bring it to a Whole Foods store, try and land that one store, eventually move to regional distribution, go and open up all of those regions and hope that your sales that you were driving in Whole Foods would translate to getting into mass market retail. It's not the case anymore. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I was trolling through Instagram as I normally do when I need to relax after a long day of work. And I saw a reel and the reel was of this founder who just two years ago was literally a starving artist. And in under two years, she was able to come up with the idea for a beauty brand, launch, launch that brand, activate that brand online, and get to $50 million in annual revenue with national distribution in Ulta and Sephora in under two years. We didn't have those stories a couple of years ago to point to. 
But the story of a modern brand has changed. A lot of times they're activating first on social media or on Amazon and then building out their brand. The story has changed. The way we consume has changed. The way that brands are coming to market has changed. And so where all this nets out is consumer trends are moving fast. Digitally native brands are taking a lot of market share slowly and then of course all at once. And that means if you're using the data and the tools that you've used historically, if you're going to the conferences you've gone to historically that historically worked, chances are you're looking in the rearview mirror. And so really that's where Helio comes in. We make it so that you guys don't miss an opportunity again. We're working with blue chip CPGs, retailers and investors, helping them peer into the crystal ball that is Helio so they can do things like create new categories of goods and services that have never existed before in this space. We're helping them do things like see emerging trends ahead of the curve so they can create the next big thing instead of get disrupted by the next big thing. And we're helping do things like identifying these epic brands that are already seeing early indicators of massive future success so they can invest early, get ahead of the curve, ride and support the wave of growth that these brands are unlocking in the market. So what is Helio? At the end of the day, it's a CPG intelligence product. Um, in terms of the coverage of the product, we look at more than 2.5 million consumer brands for more than 115 categories. We take data from more than 200 different sources and attach it to these brands so we can get a real true picture of their holistic omni-channel presence and performance. We look at data from everything from online retail to point of sale distribution to point of sale sales to web traffic, to social media, to online reviews. And really what this helps us get at is that proprietary analysis that allows us to see these market trends happen ahead of the curve, get ahead of those emerging trends, attributes or important, you know, uh, kind of other things happening in CPG, and then identify the best brands in market. Ultimately, what we do is help answer questions like how big is the market and what are key growth dynamics here? What are emerging trends in this category? And what are the key attributes driving trends in this category? What distribution channels work for this category? And who are those breakout brands that we need to be aware of so we can either invest in them, acquire them, or otherwise partner with them? So all this being said, we're going to hand things over to Anthony so he can bring us through PET. But hopefully you guys are as excited as we are to share some of the Helio Insights in PET. Great. Thank you, Steph. Uh, my name is Anthony Raymond. I lead our professional services team and sales engineering team here at Helio. Uh, prior to Helio, I spent my first nine years uh, in the working space and in CPG. I actually tried to launch a pet product myself. There's a lot of good learnings there. Specifically, don't uh, launch a, a pet water product for dogs. It didn't work out. We learned a lot, which is good. Um, but we'll take you through today how, how Helio works, um, some of the methodology that we're putting together for investing in this pet space, and some different types of analyses that, that we do when, when making an investment. So what we're really gonna to try to do today is use Helio's five key data components to identify top brands in the pet product space. Those five key components are offline sales, offline distribution, web traffic and online sales, social growth, as well as re review scores. So we'll try to uncover and confirm category trends, just make sure there's a lot of momentum going to this pet, pet products category. We'll do a little bit of market sizing, we'll look at outlook and trend analysis. We'll do a little bit of a deep dive into consumer insights and what are those key purchase criteria for consumers in this space. We'll look at top trending attributes within the space. Attributes can be anything like ingredients to, to terms that the brand is using to market itself. And then we'll also, you know, use all this information to kind of synthesize it and, and identify some of those top brands, um, as well as adding in our HGP score. So our HGP score is essentially a proprietary metric that we have. What it does is tries to predict how fast a brand is going to grow over the next 12 months relative to its primary category. So diving a little bit deeper into the category itself. So we know pet products are a large and growing category. I can confirm that with Helio. We check about 50,000 brands in pet currently covering five key custom subcategories. Those are dog food, dog supplies, cat and other pet food, cat and other pet supplies, and then pet products other. In terms of brand count over the last two years, we've seen a really nice increase there, about 16,000 new brands in the last two years, 40% growth rate in 2021, about a 6% growth rate as of January 1st, 2022. Also seeing a nice increase in total for the category in terms of offline sales, you know, pushing closer to that $2 billion mark as tracked by Helio in terms of offline sales for these categories. So definitely seeing some nice momentum there, but, but this chart here kind of breaks down a little bit of that, that market sizing analysis. 
and tries to understand, you know, what is the brand count by estimated revenue range? That's one thing Helio is able to do is, is you know, assign brands to an estimated revenue range. We see about 75% of the total brands within this space are at less than $5 million in estimated revenue um, annually. Whereas we see, you know, less than 1% of total brands are above $20 million in estimated revenue annually. That's an important metric there. When you look back to the human food category, we see about 4% of brands are larger than $20 million in estimated revenue. So we know that there's some room at the top and there's some room to take some of these emerging brands, invest in them, scale them, and get them to compete with some of those category incumbents at the top currently. And this is an interesting chart here, just in terms of, of sales activity. So on the chart on the left, we'll take a look at offline sales growth by those revenue buckets. And the chart on the right takes a look at year-on-year -year percentage growth for organic online traffic to a brand's D2C site. We use that as a proxy for online sales. Um, interesting to see here that although pet products are growing in total in offline sales, really the only revenue bucket that's driving that growth over the last 12 months is those are those brands that are above 50 million in annual offline sales. So interesting to see that and potentially there's a shift here occurring. Uh, we know that there's all these revenue buckets are growing in terms of online organic traffic, which kind of lends itself to suggest that there's more people looking to shop D2C, um, less focused on going on into offline retail brick and mortar to buy some of these brands. And then in terms of what, what consumers are looking for out of, their, out of their pet products today. So we do these analyses that are called key purchase criteria. We've got one for dog food and one for cat food. The way to read this chart is essentially those aspects at, at the x-axis there are the most important aspects for consumers to purchase a product in this space. And then the, the y-axis looks at the relative weight for, for, for each of those aspects. So if you're looking at dog food, we know that the smell of the dog food, the value for money, ingredient quality, flavor, and texture are most important when consumers are making a purchase decision. And then we can also see how the how um, average review ratings are changing by each of those key aspects. So we look at the median average review rating here as done by consumers. We see that you know scent and value for money, uh, you know, are not great, are not getting great average reviews. We see that there's a lot of brands out there that are really scoring highly on ingredient quality, flavor. Um, but some definitely some room for opportunity in, in the sense of the products and also the value that they're getting for the products that they're pre presenting to consumers. A similar chart here for cat food, we see a little bit more emphasis here on value for money, flavor, and ingredient quality. Again, you know, one of those metrics that is not scoring very well is scent. Um, probably some opportunity for flavor in these products to increase as well. And then as mentioned earlier, we, we track about 16 million different attributes within the Helio universe. Um, and these things, like I said, could be ingredients, they could be terms, they could be, you know, themes such as sustainability. Um, and we have some of those fastest growing pet brand attributes on the left here. So we see, you know, sustainably source is a really growing uh, attribute for brands, about 14 brands that we track that are mentioning that in their marketing. Meal plans are becoming more and more popular. Uh, rice chi and chaga, which are mushroom type ingredients that are becoming more popular as well. Organic plants, plant-based, soy protein, free of preservatives. Um, single ingredient, really super premium types of, of food and, and, and pet supplies products are, are really trending very well and getting some, some brand count attention there. And then lastly, subscription. You know, seeing a lot of growth there in terms of our last 12 months uh, percentage growth in organic traffic, as well as offline sales. There's about 217 brands that we track that offer that subscription service today. And then as we look over to the right here, we, we can see some of those, you know, more broad attributes that have a really high social following. So we see consumers following brands that are natural, that have protein, um, that are offering accessories like collars, leashes, supplements, toys, have some type of custom ability there as well, um, and are aiding and training. So that's where consumers are today. Uh, the chart on the left more so speaks to where we think they're going to be tomorrow. And then using all that information, we can synthesize it down to, you know, five key brands here that we think are doing a lot, a lot of this stuff really well. Uh, the first brand here is um, Cookie Pal. They're human-grade dog treats. Um, some of their key attributes are they're organic, they're plant-based, they're natural treats, super premium, very sustainable. Um, they're in that 500K to $1 million annual rev rev revenue range, up about 320% over the last year, which is great growth, in about 1,000 offline distribution doors right now have a 4.9 average view rating and our HGP score is 0.99. So on a scale from zero to one, one being the highest, seeing that score up there is, is great to see for them. Jumping down to the next brand is, is Shameless Pets. They convert food waste to dog and cat treats using upcycled ingredients. 
So some of their key attributes are upcycle, sustainable skin and joint health. They offer a subscription service, slightly larger than Cookie Pal. We have them at between one and $5 million estimated revenue range, seeing a lot of great growth there. And about 6,000 doors right now, up about 300% versus last year, which is great growth for them. Bocce's Bakery is up next. They do biscuits, training aids, and jerkies. Some of their key attributes are limited ingredient. Um, their, their training aids are, are treats, so helping that way. Locally sourced and then preservative free. Um, they're at about five, $10 million estimated revenue range and about 5,000 retail doors currently. And the next brand here is Earth Rated. They do wipes and bags. Some of the key attributes that they have are again, very sustainable. All their products are 100% compostable. They're plant-based in nature and they're hypoallergenic. Their estimated revenue range is between 10 and 20 million. Uh, have a nice growth rate there. Again, a very high average review rating, really high number of social followers, which is nice to see. And again, a, a 0.99 HGP score. Then last but not least is a really fun company here called Fresh Paws. They do dog accessories. Um, some of their key attributes are leash, collar, walkwear, streetwear, and bowls. Um, art focused here, um, very trendy in, in their product nature as well. I'm um, seeing a lot of growth in terms of estimated revenue range here, up about a thousand percent. Not not too much distribution offline here, but are growing at 100 or 850 percent versus last year. So, um, just an overview of, of some of the key brands that we see in Helio projected for growth over the next year. And now back to Steph. Thanks, Anthony. I don't know about you guys, but I'm personally really excited about the Fresh Paws. I got to see those for the first time because of Helio and can't wait for Cooper's streetwear to be totally next level. Um, Sam, thank you so much for jumping on with us. Um, for those listening in, we're going to just do a little Q&A session with Sam, who is part of our CGP team, um, Circle Up Growth Partners team here at Circle Up. Um, Sam, do you want to just give a quick introduction of yourself and, and maybe just a brief background? Yeah. Um, thanks, Steph. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm a partner here at Circle Up, um, focused on all things consumer. So leading the sourcing and diligence process of our investments, bringing them to IC and then partnering with uh, these companies and portfolio um, and board uh, capacities. Um, background has been you know, investing in consumer joint circle about a year and a half ago. Dad's an entrepreneur in the consumer space. So grew up around the sort of storytelling and magic of, of selling brands um, and branded products. And he always would say, you know, I would come to the dinner table and ask him a ton of questions. You know, be like, Sam, you love, love asking questions. You should be an investor because if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need answers. Um, so that was one thing that stuck with me. Um, and it's part of the reason I ended up in the CIM today. But uh, excited to discuss pet. It's a great category. Yeah, um, I love that story. I didn't know that background on you. So Sam, when you think about, you know, how you and the team at Circle Up, you know, operates and, and uses Helio, what are some of the signals that are really important to you guys when sourcing for emerging brands and pet? Um, I think pet's unique um, in terms of the quality signals because of the nature of the business models. So when you think about pet, it's a um, massive category with high, with high switching costs. Once you get a dog or cat on a certain diet, it's very difficult for them to switch from that just because of the consumer behavior. So what you see is a lot of pets feel comfortable spending a lot to acquire customers. CACs are usually you know, two to three times more than what you'll see in other industries because the LTV of that consumer is so high because they don't necessarily churn once you get them on. Um, hence why they're very good D2C businesses or at least solid D2C businesses. So compared to other categories, signals here, you're really trying to approximate online growth, D2C growth, because you know how the environment has changed where scaling a business off the backs of Facebook has become the exception, not the rule. Let's say it's a, a food or beverage or beauty brand, that's less of a compelling signal as it once was. But using something like Instagram growth or online traffic growth um, to approximate revenue growth via D2C, um, because it's more of like a second or third order signal. If you're selling more online, there's probably more people visiting your stores. Um, that's a really helpful signal. I think one thing that I leverage is thinking strategically about the, the period or timeline on these signals. So looking at trailing three months and like quarter over quarter growth to find like inflections. So 
I think it's really helpful instead of like discovering that new brands, you know, I see a brand that I, I've heard about because my friend uses them or I read them an article, I add them to Helio and then I automate a search where it says, you know, I want to see every month or every three months brands that I've determined as quality for some sort of reason, um, but are growing 50% quarter over quarter in online traffic. And so spit out all those brands. So it's that pre-filtered search. You're going at it instead of random, but with some sort of direction that is adjacent and aligned to revenue growth so that from there you could be a bit more um, systematic in, in your sourcing. That was really incredibly helpful. Thank you so much for sharing that. What are some indicators of when it could make sense to reach out to brands that you previously discovered on Helio or maybe discovered through other means, but then have been tracking through Helio? Yeah, I think that's um, very much to that latter point I was making is like that re-engagement indicator of something growing above the median tread line. So um, if a brand spikes a certain signal, uh, specifically in pet, let's talk about um, online traffic and Instagram, um, having that point in time surfacing is super helpful. So I see that you had Instagram growth grow 30% month over month, which is quite high or over the trailing three months. What that means is probably there was some sort of activation that drew new consumers to their social. Maybe there was a partnership, maybe there was a post that went viral. Um, and so this is a good signal for both growth and like maybe it's an interesting time they're raising capital. Um, so it's a bit more of a, the context of the outreach is a bit more, I would say, uh, high conversion. So there's obviously like the performance side of the equation, which you've talked about. Then there's the differentiation side of the equation. What analysis do you leverage in Helio to get a better understanding of the differentiation of a brand? Yeah, I think like when you're trying to understand a category and a thesis, you're trying to understand a few things. You're looking for product market fit. And I think there's Product market fit is composed of two things, composed of product and market. So let's start with market. Market is essentially you're solving pro a certain problem for a set of consumers that matters to them. And product is your product is solving that in a differentiated way that is better or stands out compared to other similar products. So I think first we're trying to solve is like, does what they're solving matter to consumers? You know, is this frozen brand? Um, actually a needle mover for people who are debt dog owners like why why does frozen matter and do people actually care and so we could use reviews to approximate you know one thing that frozen um the value prop frozen is that it is whole ingredients the color of it is really compelling to people because you could see um the raw red meat you could see the frozen vegetables and it, and it comes off as like more healthy um, another thing is sort of the convenience. It has similar profiles of wet, fresh food, but it's frozen. It's more of a solid rather than like a mush. And so it's easier to clean up. And so you could use the reviews to approximate, is there a market fit for this brand? Um, so you could say, yes, people talk about how it's not messy in, in positive reviews, or they talk about how they love the color or things like that. And then you want to find out like, is this brand doing something differentiated where they're speaking specifically to them? And you could say, are they switching from fresh or, or normal solids or kibble? And so you are differentiated because of the form factor and because of the, the, pro, the market fit you found. Or are they switching from other frozens because maybe it's a more premium ingredient or inversely, maybe because it's cheaper? And can we use reviews analysis to come to some sort of conclusion about that? So maybe it's a cheaper offering and people are saying um, price and affordability and um, or maybe in other reviews of competitors, a main churn point and a main source of friction is the cost. And so we can say, hey, this brand, this is a brand that's, uh, there's a competitor in the space that is, you know, 50% more expensive that has scale, but a main reason that people are unhappy is because of the price. And so we think that price is really important. And we obviously see that there's demand for the problems that they're solving and their uniqueness. This is why we believe in this. Thanks for breaking down the answer that way. That was, again, really insightful. 
and I think points at the next question, which is a lot of people, you know, could do everything that you just mentioned entirely manually, or they can augment that manual experience of compiling that data, compiling that understanding of differentiation, using technology to aid and to support. How does Helio improve your speed? Or, or maybe talk about how Helio kind of informs your day-to-day -day a little bit for us. Yeah, I think, so, and I'll break it down from the funnel. Sourcing, it increases the conversion of your source. It, it allows for higher signal to noise filtration. By this, I mean, you know when to say no, and you do not make those outreaches that are not interesting because you have these approximations for growth and you can be way more systematic in terms of why you're reaching out to a company because of these growth variables or these things that you've identified as important to this category or this investment thesis. On the diligencing side, you know, you have metrics that are good barometers of growth. These are metrics that you could have through Helio. These are metrics like the PL, these are metrics like unit economics that you collect. But when you're building a qualitative thesis, you're really trying to understand what is that atomic unit of the product, which is like, what is the hook? What is the qualitative thesis here to determine product market fit and why this will be a big outcome? And a lot of that is collecting third party data, whether that's like, you know, name your consulting firm that's coming out with a report on this category or, you know, some third party research that you don't know the inputs. You're not really the one who's creating the hypothesis. Um, and so it's relatively less interesting. And I don't know about you. I don't know where I'm going to go speak to a thousand consumers and talk to them about raw pet food. Um, so it's that combination of, you know, quite instantly you get really strong population of data. You get proprietary research where you're conducting the hypothesis and can, can tailor and iterate. Um, and I think that's what differentiates investors and us is we are coming up the hypothesis. We're not relying on McKinsey's questioning and hypothesis, hypothesizing, if that's a word, um, and research. It's, it's way more fundamental. It's way more than rigorous in your own decision-making process where we are constantly questioning what matters um, and then back testing that and then reviewing that and having heated debates um, that I think is ultimately the most powerful thing in that you know, as users of SERP, as of Helio, that will always continue to be the best users of it because we, we know what matters or we're constantly focused on that. And I think that the best consumers of Helio will be having a similar perspective. I feel like I want to ask you one surprise question just for the heck of it. When you think yeah. about it, you know, you have conversations with entrepreneurs all day, every day. You are personally like interested in the, the pet space and, um, and Helio obviously has interest in the pet space. What are you most excited about in like the humanization of pet or like the future of pet as we think about it? Um, it's a good question. I think you're seeing, you know, there's some emerging trends that you're seeing in like pet supplements, um, which I think are interesting but i think they're probably over i think the, the optimisms i'm a bit more pessimistic on it um i'm happy to go into detail why but that's no thing i think what i am interested in is capital efficiency i think there are a lot of macro reasons why businesses need to be optimizing for capital efficiency now i think we are probably heading towards more volatility, more pressure, um, and more risk. And so people are have spent a lot of money on pets. A lot of people have gotten pets. And now people are going to be a bit more price conscious, I think. And so how can you create a compelling brand positioning at a affordable price point, but do so in a relatively capital efficient manner? Because I think liquidity is just going to be harder. And so a lot of pet businesses require and rely on access to venture and growth capital to scale. Um, so that means maybe getting to retail. Um, a brand you had up here, Shameless Pet, um, is one that I'm quite eager about. I like the brand positioning of being upcycled, which allows them to have better input costs. Then I also like the distribution where, you know, you could sell wholesale. It's not as sexy as DSC, but that's good cash conversion. Um, so what is 
what is that brand? Um, it's been relatively capital efficient at scale. And so looking at interesting, you no, know, I always come back to like unfair, some sort of leverage or unfair advantage of product quality, distribution or customer acquisition. Um, so it seems like they have distribution and product quality. Um, as long as you have one of those, I think you're in a good place. Um, and those ultimately all lead to more capital efficiency. Awesome. Well, thanks for giving us the hot takes. And it didn't sound so hot. It sounds actually like very, very thoughtful and thought through. So we appreciate your time, Sam. We're going to transition now to some of the Q&A from all of you guys, the audience um, that was either submitted ahead of time or if you want to submit right now. So let's call Anthony back up to the stage to dive into a few questions. All right, Anthony. Question number one is how do companies use Helio to do proactive thesis development? And that can be in the pet space or just in general. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, one of the nice things about Helio is we have this omni-channel look and I, I don't wanna say category agnostic, but we can be at times. Um, so essentially, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people that have a thesis around, we wanna be in this specific category, but may not, not, may not know why other than there's just sales growth happening there. So what we can do with Helio is provide some of that deeper level growth under attribute growth. You know, what are those key attributes that are driving percentages growth for this category? What are some of those brands that are really aiding in growth for the category? Is there enough momentum there? Is, is there enough brand count and disruption happening within that category that I think gets lost sometimes? Um, and then one of the other nice things that we can do to help synthesize that investment thesis is oftentimes trends that are happening in adjacent categories end up migrating to that category you have focus on. So this is a great example of you know working with some some clients that are looking at beverage brands, um, but we all we know that there's a lot of really unique personal care and beauty trends that are now popping up in beverage. Helio can actually be able to source those and identify those, and then use those as filters to dive deeper into brands within a specific space. Um, so a, a lot of stuff you can do with, with people there in terms of creating investment thesis. Awesome. And thank you for sharing just on the, uh, how you can even look to adjacent categories for inspiration within your own category and thesis development. How do companies then use Helio to do target identification or brand sourcing or get deal flow, so to speak? Yeah, I think we have our, our SaaS platform, certainly. There's also an opportunity to work with our professional services team to do a more of a, a curated look. Uh, but essentially what you would do is, is pretty similar to what we did in our analysis here. You take a look at those category trends, take a look at some, at some key attributes. Um, also in this, you know, the SaaS platform, we're able to sort by our HGP scores. You can see all those brands in those categories, what we're scoring them as. Uh, if you want to focus more on offline sales growth or distribution or a specific type of data metric, we have those available in the SaaS platform as well to really hone in on your sourcing list. Um, and as mentioned before, if there's certain key attributes or key themes that you want to look up, we're able to do that in Helio as well, uh, entering those in and using those as filters too. So maybe talking a little bit about pet specifically now, when you think about brands that are winning in pet, one of the questions our audience has is, are the winners focused on getting all of a pet's total consumer dollars or more narrowly focused on, I don't know, let's say like treats specifically or toys specifically? What are we seeing here in the data? Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a mix. I would say that for the treat specific companies, and there are a lot of companies that are treat specific, I think it's a much easier business model for D2C. It's a much lower uh, barrier to entry in a lot of ways. Um, as Sam mentioned before, it's really hard to break in as kind of a holistic brand with treats plus, plus food offerings. A lot of those foods are kind of determined by vets and to break consumers away from that is pretty difficult. Uh, on the other side, I think with treats, it's just a lower barrier. I think consumers are more willing to try try new treats for their pets uh, and not have them recommended by their by their vets. Awesome. And maybe kind of continuing on in the conversation of pet, when you think about this idea of the humanization of pets in the household, are you finding that there is consumer demand for on-trend attributes from humans, like the blurring of the lines between human and pet care? For example, have you found that there is consumer demand for plant-based pet foods or upcycled pet foods or better for you? Tell us about that. 100%, you know, pets are now more than ever part of the family. And I think, you know, consumers as they're eating things themselves to be more healthy, want to feed the same types of ingredients and, and clean labels to, to their pets as well. Um, so certainly plant-based has increased. Um, I think like, you know, overall pet snacking has increased as a means for training and, and weight control too. Um, also allows for on-the-go consumption. We think about, you know, pet, I, I won't say owners because that's that's crass now, it's it's pet parents 
um, that are, you know, looking for on-the-go consumption, pets being a part of their daily hikes or walks. So like always having that type of synthesis with your pet. Um, and it goes from, you know, better for you, plant-based, also goes to caring about the environment. So all of that stuff, I think that is migrating over into pet for sure. This is a very specific question, but um, one that, that you shared on earlier that I thought was pretty compelling. When we looked at the differentiation of brands, obviously you noted that uh, some of the themes that stand out in consumer reviews included like the scent, the taste. Taste was a little odd to me. I'm like, how would we know <laughs> what the taste is? But you mentioned some research that you found recently on that topic. Yeah, we're going to say that about 40% of pet parents are sampling, sampling their pet's food. So it just, you know, gives that desire to be more high quality, human grade type ingredients, uh, premium, uh, and in a lot of ways, plant-based as well. If there's no other questions for the audience, I think we're going to wrap it at that. But thank you all so much for joining. We hope that you learned something new today about the category of pet. Hopefully you saw some new brands that you're super excited to go in do some additional research on. If there's anything Anthony or I can do for you guys from a trends thesis development or brand sourcing perspective, please don't hesitate to reach out. All of our contact information is listed on the slide you see in front of you. And if you just want to, you know, talk about how cute my dog was, I am open to LinkedIn comments about that as well. So thank you guys so much for spending your afternoon this way and we'll talk to you soon.